So you have created content and you're an investor. What are you most excited about these days, Sam? I'm excited about the opportunity to, bol to do both. And I, I think those worlds are merging, uh, both for professional investors and, uh, and for the general public as well. So um, a guy named Mark Andreessen once said, uh, what's, what's his famous line he's so known for? He said, software is eating the world. Okay. What if I said to you, interactive is eating the world? What does that mean to you in terms of your worldview? And what does that mean to you in terms of investing? Um, yeah, in a lot of ways, it, it defines everything that I'm focused on investing to, in today. Uh, you know, Mark, when he said that, was talking about this phenomenon where hardware, just by being so much more capital efficient and, and able to scale, it was ultimately replacing the need for hardware. And I think we're seeing the same thing in, in interactivity and, and in interactive uh, content and tech, where we're seeing people engaging in, in, in content in such a new way that the old version of 2D sort of laid back passive content uh, is, is being replaced by people's desire and need to, to meet and interact with people in digital worlds and to engage in behavior that is ultimately so much more about leaning in um, and participating than being passive. So, so the new digital future, what is it, in terms of our conscious time, you know, I, I understand there's like multiple screens, you watch TV, but there isn't screens when you're sleeping. So, <laughs> but during our conscious time, um, we spend a lot with our digital devices, immersive experiences. What do you see as the key characteristics of this new digital frontier? I mean, I see we're more connected than ever before, but in some ways we're disconnected because we're just looking down <laughs> at our rectangles. But in this new era, what, what do you see uh, as the digital frontier? I mean, I think this point about screen time is a really important one, and we've heard so many different people talk about, I think, the implications of what's going on here. And I mean, in, in many ways, I mean, I come from the first half of my career in old traditional media, and, and, and as people uh, acquired new devices and ways to look at content, we started paying a lot of attention to how much time they actually were um, spending immersed in these devices. And when we'd talk about this concept of second screens and third screens came up as people would watch TV and then they were watching TV and they were on their laptop or they were watching TV on their laptop playing with their phone. And I mean, I think at this point people are spending more than 100% of their conscious time uh, immersed in their devices. Um, I think there are, there are tremendously positive implications of this. There's, you know, we've heard of some of the, some of those from the prior speakers today, and we talked about the, you know, people who are learning behavior and, and um, engaging in, in new ways as a result of playing games and growing up in video games, and then those best practices spilling into things like learning music and, uh, and, and ultimately meeting their friends. I think there's all kinds of uh, potentially negative implications of this that we need to be aware of. We heard about brainwashing, and we and we heard about uh, you know information and mind control uh, and misinformation. And you know we used to put kids in front of a television for uh, you know five, six hours a day, ten hours a day, and at, at least in that way it was sort of a, a broadcast model of information, and a, and we it was regulated, and we could know and trust what people were seeing and what they were doing, and it was one directional. I mean now. I read the other day kids are spending, five-year-olds are spending close to five hours a day on screens. Um, five hours a day. Now, that can be a wonderful thing, but we better think about what's on that screen. And, you know, we, I grew up with this whole idea of stranger danger and an, and an effort to really control and make sure that we knew who our kids were talking to. And, and, and today, I mean, they're not only in front of a screen, but they're interacting with thousands of people that they don't know every day. Um, and, and that's where, again, the opportunity to learn and grow from that is enormous. But, but obviously the risks are real too. So I know you're someone who's written a lot and spoken a lot about self-sovereign individual. And I want to get to that. But before I do, can you define metaverse? What does it mean? I know Facebook changed their name to meta, but that's like big M metaverse. There's, there's a little m metaverse mm. that's much bigger. How, how, do you, how do you view the metaverse? And then I, I'd love for you to describe what is this self-sovereign individual today, and why, why should people care about that? I mean, the, the idea of the metaverse, it, it's amazing. It's something that uh, you almost have to define that term every time you want to have a conversation about it because of the odds of any two people uh, having the same idea in their mind uh, it, it's, it has become pretty slim. Um, I mean, to me, and, and we heard earlier this concept of uh, 
the metaverse being the, the merging in some way of the digital and physical world. Uh, I, I think that's true. I think it's. I think in a lot of ways we can just imagine the metaverse being uh, th that moment where we really are primarily um, living, fundamentally living uh, with and through our digital devices, and 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 you know. Um, with our digital identities taking, in many cases, priority over our physical ones. Um, I, I think in a lot of ways we're already there. I mean, again, if you believe that people are really spending such a majority of their time digitally, if once we're at a point, and, and, and we are for most younger people certainly today, where the majority of our social relationships are happening uh, digitally, the most of what we buy is being done uh, through our digital devices, uh, our, our entertainment and activities, our learning. When all of this is happening um, in digital worlds of one kind or another uh, and uh, th through interaction with the, the, the digital avatars that we create for ourselves, um, th that to me is at least the most meaningful idea of the metaverse uh, before we want to get all the way. I mean, there's this sense of the oasis from Ready Player One and the Matrix and, and those types of things. And that's, in, in many respects, a more technologically and philosophically interesting idea, and we're working towards that, and the technologies are being built today that will someday power something approximating that. Self-sovereign uh, individual. Self -so I, I mean, r really what that's about is um, what are what is this immersion and this existence in digital in digital worlds and the ability of people at um, at such a young age now to ultimately build and be empowered for themselves, create and ultimately monetize the things that they create. So we heard earlier that sort of Web one, the idea of reading, and Web two being reading and writing, and Web three being owning. Um, you, you know, as and this is where the kind of Web three comes into this idea of immersive digital. We're the, these young kids are developing skills um, and, they're, and they're creating and they're being encouraged. And a lot of this was Web 2. Over the last 10, 15 years, people have been encouraged to create things and contribute things to those worlds. And now they're being given the tools to monetize those things um, and, and to monetize them globally at scale borderlessly. And so that, that's this thing that I, I don't think people fully understand the, the, the potential when you start to allow people who've, who've grown up expecting and they're playing Roblox and they're playing Minecraft and, and it's only gonna go up from there. But they're, they're learning and being encouraged to make things and then they're, then they're empowered to sell those things. And, and you know, that matters for young kids. It really matters for people in developing worlds, uh, you know, developing countries. We're seeing people now who have the ability to compete uh, at, you know, globally for jobs um, that are paid uh, for in the same currency um, and, and really where you're monetizing and enabling people to earn a living uh, on an equal playing field. And so that, that empowerment is a lot of what I've meant when I've talked about that, that self-sovereign individual. Great. I'm going to stack these last two questions. Sure. And then I want, I want a final statement. I grew up with the Atari 2600. There was a game called Pitfall. Loved it. What are the pitfalls of, of Web3? What are the uh, glaring risks? Uh, and then the second question is, what should we be watching, reading, and listening to uh, as we go into this new uh, digital frontier? And then just a closing statement on what you're excited about Web3. Um, I mean, the glaring risks of Web3, maybe to Web3 right now, regulatory risk. Um, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of things we could talk about and I could speculate on, on, on what the risk is to individuals out there that are trying to participate in Web3 and whether we're talking about buying NFTs and, and, and all the risk associated with that. But really the single biggest risk to Web3 right now, uh, and it's, it's an existential one in my opinion, is, is just that we get the regulatory um, action required to responsibly manage it. Uh, wrong, particularly in this country, and I think um, we, there's a very real chance that as a result of um, misregulating this technology, we miss the opportunity to, to be, I mean, we have been such an innovative, innovation leader in, in the United States um, over the decades, and we're in jeopardy of uh, really missing the opportunity. Yeah, the dollar has been the, you know, the, the standard, and we've got to be able to you know, come up with regulation for the web and stuff, and are we still going to have that role? in this new frontier. If yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's a risk to all of us, and, and I think that, that's why everybody should get involved in it, at least learn and understand um, what, what this is and, and participate. Right, watching, listening, like 
consuming of this world? What, what advice do you have to people? I, I mean, I think podcasts, and there's so many of them, um, but uh, uh, Invest Like the Best is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge junkie for history podcasts, and yeah. especially now, I, I would say, uh, and, and every day, unfortunately, we're reminded of how important it is to, to study history and, and, and understand um, the ways in which our worst mistakes uh, seem to just keep repeating themselves. Great. So, um, so Dan closing Carlin. statement, what, what do people not know about Web3 or what are you excited that, that people should know? Um, I, I'm excited for people to, to get to experience. Uh, I, I think the greatest thing about Web3 is uh, is the and this brings us back full circle to the idea of content and, and, and investing. It really is an opportunity for every person to participate and feel a little bit of the thrill. This is, in my opinion, what this whole NFT thing is about. For example, it's it's people that maybe previously didn't actually um, ever really experience that sort of producer's high of being a patron to the arts and enabling uh, in enabling you to empower people to create things and to earn their living by creating things. And that is actually what I think is fueling so much of the excitement and, and thrill uh, in the space. And so I would say just if you're interested in that, dig in and, and go try. Great. Well, thank you for Thanks. being a lead investor in the space, and uh, we'll be watching you. Thanks, John. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam Engelbart.